According to the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization Office of Statistics, there are a total of 59 million primary school age children who are not receiving a quality education worldwide. For lower secondary school age children, that number stands at 62 million. And for upper secondary school students, the number comes in at 138 million. Henry Yamposki is the Assistant Director of Education Outreach and Conflict Resolution at Virginia Tech's Office of Equality and Accessibility. He also teaches conflict resolution, mediation, and peace building as a part of Virginia Tech's Center for Peace Studies and violence prevention. He is also a TEDx speaker and best-selling author who is passionate about creating safe spaces for transformational conversations. And Yamposki joined me this week to have a conversation about cultivating educational equality. For all, I'm Kevin McShane. Let's have this conversation. take a moment to welcome you to the program and I'm, I'm super excited to talk to you about educational equality this morning. Thanks for a few minutes before we all uh, sit down to Turkey today my friend. Nice to see you this morning. Thank you so much Kevin. Thank you for inviting me. It's such an honor to be talking to you. Absolutely. Uh, the feeling my friend is mutual and I know Henry that you serve as the assistant director of Educational Outreach and Conflict Resolution at uh, Virginia Tech's Office of Equality and Accessibility. And you also uh, teach conflict resolution and mediation as well. So I'm wondering if you can tell me about all the good work that you do. Sure, sure, Kevin. So I am very fortunate uh, to really be uh, working in my passion. So I really don't have to work at all. Um, I just get to to do what I'm absolutely passionate about. Um, and so uh, there are a few roles that I have at Virginia Tech. And Virginia Tech, and, and I think, Kevin, you're based in Canada, right? So uh, I don't know how familiar you are with Virginia Tech, but Virginia Tech is a large public university in, in southwest corner of Virginia, uh, an institution that has a very, very complicated history. Um, of course, this part of the country has been very deeply steeped uh, in racism, uh, in all sorts of exclusion uh, for hundreds of years. Um, and that's where I think I have an, a very special opportunity working at Virginia Tech um, to really um, create a very different space and a more equitable space, a more welcoming space and than the institution has been through many points of its history. So my role at Virginia Tech, uh, there's really three key components. First uh, is I hold space for people uh, who may be experiencing some conflict um, related to, you know, some kind of protected identity issue. This could be race, this could be color, uh, gender, uh, national origin, uh, disability, things like that. Uh, and and so very often, uh, you know, before maybe something rises to the level where it's a civil rights violation, it becomes an opportunity for us to engage. 
and for me to help facilitate that conversation. Also, uh, as you mentioned, I teach. Uh, I teach as part of the Center for Peace Studies and Violence Prevention. Unfortunately, Virginia Tech has a very sad distinction uh, as being a site of one of the worst school shootings um, on a college campus in, 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 in America. Uh, yeah, it's a distinction that now sadly is um, more and more institutions and places are joining, just as we see in the news even, even this week. Uh, but in Virginia Tech, it happened in 2007. And one of the results of this shooting was the creation of a Center for Peace Studies and Violence Prevention, uh, where folks study, you know, different ways to prevent violence. And I now have an opportunity to teach students uh, how to actually be mediators, how to be facilitators, how to be peace builders. So these are my roles um, at Virginia Tech. Uh, I also train, uh, the third aspect of my job is that I train uh, members of the university community on various rules and procedures relating to civil rights and civil rights compliance. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, leading into my next question, uh, uh, considering the work uh, that you do, Henry, I'm also uh, curious to ask you, how do you define the term educational Equality. What does that look like for you? Mm. So educational equality, first and foremost, begins with inclusion. And, 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 and you know, uh, Kevin, I, I work and talk a lot about inclusion because I think um, the opposite of violence actually is not peace, but inclusion. Uh, inclusion meaning a lifelong practice of refusing to other anyone. So in the educational setting, it is creating space for all. Because part of the educational experience, of course, is encountering people, connecting with people, engaging with people who are different from us. And so to me, educational equality is creating space uh, a truly inclusive space, inclusive space uh, where people could come from various backgrounds, uh, where people could learn uh, from each other and engage with each other, um, and where people could engage in a meaningful dialogue. You know, and now meaningful dialogue is relatively rare, right? We tend to uh, engage with each other in terms of our positions, shouting of positions, and if we disagree, uh, we attack whoever is holding the position. Um, and so that's what I see educational equality. Um, and of course, educational equality, and this is where also, you know, um, it has to do with equity. So educational equality I see is giving equal opportunity to all, including all. But this is also very much related to equity, um, where while seeing all and giving opportunities to all we also see each person as complex multi-dimensional being that they are and see and consider their individual needs and treat them as a complex multi-dimensional individual that they are yeah and, and you know Henry, one of the uh, passions of my life is i live by the saying that inclusion is the gateway to independence. And as you know, I was born with uh, a cerebral palsy. And one of the uh, greatest parts of my educational journey when I was in college was uh, really advocating on behalf of students with disabilities because mm -hmm. I, I was one, of course, when I was in college and all throughout my educational journey. So with that as a backdrop, I'm curious to ask you, when we talk about creating a pathway for uh, students with disabilities to be successful and to excel, excel. what does that uh, pathway look like in your opinion? So first, conceptually, right, um, we take the golden rule, the famous golden rule, treat others the way you would like to be treated, and we modify that. And we modify that to treat others the way they would like to be treated. 
And this is especially true for individuals with disabilities. I think it's engaging with people. It's asking what is important for them. What is it that they need to succeed? What is it that they need to be included? Because first part of inclusion, is, in, in my view, Kevin, is it's not that we or, some, we or someone gets to decide what the person needs. It's that the person with needs who is part of the conversation, whose needs are considered, who can advocate and speak for themselves and let everyone else know uh, what is needed, what is included. Um, and, and, and in my work, uh, I advocate uh, for individuals with disabilities. And this, this means, you know, ensuring that they feel fully included in every aspect of campus's life. They feel fully included in every class. And if this means that instructors, you know, need to maybe modify the course a little bit um, to make it more inclusive, maybe use different grading uh, structures and criteria. Again, that's all necessary and useful uh, to create this inclusive space. Because as I see it, as I see it, my life certainly has been enrich enriched um, by working with individuals with disabilities, learning from them, seeing them, and so this is, and, and, and when we create a truly inclusive space, everyone's life is enriched. Everyone uh, gains from that. Uh, and everyone is able to walk away from the experience knowing something about themselves, the world, or the people that they did not know before. Yeah, Henry, there's value in diversity of perspective, isn't there? Mm-hmm. Oh, absolutely, 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 and 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 that's where um, we truly talk about inclusion. You know, inclusion is 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 easy to talk about when we are talking about people who are like us, but inclusion is much more challenging and also much more critical when we are talking about anyone, someone who is in any way different. And that's where the true value of inclusion to me is, where we include everyone. And we start seeing and experiencing everyone as part of us, as part of us. So, Kevin, you know, if I, even for a moment, even for a moment, could ex truly experience you as part of me, then does anyone need to tell me, does anyone need to tell me not to harm you, not to mistreat you? Uh, not, not, not to other you. And to me, this is a key and this is a critical, critical aspect of inclusion when we start experiencing other people as part of us. You know, my arm and my leg look very differently. They function differently, but they're part of the same whole. They're part of the same whole. And if I can experience another being, you or other people, as being part of the same whole, our relationship and the way we connect and the way we are fundamentally changes. Yeah, absolutely. You know, uh, I, mean, I always say that everyone's portrait of uh, success is different in that if we uh, embrace diversity, we can uh, accelerate our path towards a u unity faster. Would you agree with that? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Look, ultimately, at the source of all violence, at the source of all violence we see in the world, is the idea that someone is the other, right? So the more we can move to the idea that we're all part of the same whole and truly experience this, not just this have be an intellectual idea, but truly experience this, that we're all integral parts of the same hall, the sooner we can move from violence uh, to connection, to peace, uh, to true dialogue, to true learning, to true expansion. Yeah, and, and Henry, I know that you've worked all over the world in the field of uh, conflict resolution, and you've 
black kid around the world in some international places as well. Uh, so I'm wondering if you can tell me about some of those experiences and how they've impacted you as an educator. Sure, sure. Well, what a what what a great um, question, Kevin. You know, I, I I've been fortunate enough to have lived and traveled and uh, around the world. I was born in Ukraine, uh, sadly now a place that that's that's in the news. I came to the United States uh, as a refugee about 25 years ago. And since then, you know, I lived in different places in the US, but also had an opportunity to work uh, abroad. Uh, I've spent a lot of time in India, and that in many ways influenced my work and influenced how I approach um, life. And Kevin, you know, when when you spend time with with people around the world, there's something astonishing. You know, you start discovering how different people are and also how similar they are, how similar they are. You know, everywhere around the world that I went, uh, I've encountered people who ultimately were thriving for the same things and, and, and wanted um, something very, very similar. And so... You know, of course, on a superficial level, there may be differences. Someone may enjoy different food or different, have a different way of communicating. But as we connect a little bit deep, deeper, as we connect a little bit deeper, beyond even our story, beyond even our story, we discover something very, very profound. And, and Kevin, you know, I made a very, some interesting um, discoveries about the nature even of our identity. You know, I started to see our identities as boundaries. And like all boundaries, for some time, they can define us. And in some ways, they can protect us. And then there comes a point, like all boundaries, they start limiting and confining us. And so the key, the key to true connection um, is for us to go beyond these boundaries. And, and as we go beyond these boundaries, we start seeing that universal oneness. We start seeing that infinite and intimate connection that we have with each other. Uh, and infinite and intimate connection we, we each have to each other's humanity. Yeah, absolutely, and part of those uh, principles, Henry, you've put in uh, your best-selling acclaimed uh, now or book, The Dissolving Conflict from Within. So I'm wondering if you can tell me about the book, the message behind it, and what uh, compelled you to write it in the first place. Sure. So, Kevin, I work with a lot of conflicts, and I noticed that in most situations, People just react to conflict. And, you know, in the West, we tend to use the words reaction and response interchangeably. But actually, I suggest they have very, very different meanings. So when we react, we try to avoid, always escape or control whoever or whatever is triggering us. And, and mostly this is just driven by fear, by fear when, that we get in conflict. So then what is a response? Response is the right action for the situation. There is not one size fits all, which arises from an undisturbed state, which arises from an undisturbed state. Because by its very nature, when we are reacting, our state is already disturbed. So this book is really a guide of how we move from reacting to conflict with fear, with avoidance, with aggression, to responding with strength, with clarity, and with compassion. And in the book, I talk about four principles of conflict transformation, and I found that these principles apply whether we're talking about an interpersonal conflict, you know, two friends or life partners are having a disagreement, to or to, or to even, you know, the great social justice issues that we face or the international conflicts that we face. And these four principles of conflict transformation include tuning inward, observation without evaluation, expansion, and exploration. 
And when I talk about tuning inward, it's one of the most important aspects of it. I am talking about mindfulness, but I'm talking about mindfulness not in a Western sense. So in the West, we talk about mindfulness as a way to feel better. But I suggest we need to do mindfulness and, and engage in inner practices to get better at feeling. Meaning we become more sensitive to life. We become more sensitive to other people. Naturally, as we tune within, naturally as we go within, we start becoming more and more inclusive. Observation without evaluation um, means we move away from the need to put a label on life and put a label on people. And we start just communicating with each other in terms of observing. And of course, one of the purest forms of observation without evaluation is listening, active listening, uh, true listening, like you are doing now, like, um, you know, that, that, that becomes such a critical key to true connection. The third aspect of it, expansion. And this is where we start expanding from positions. And most of our interactions now and most of our discourse is purely positional. And we expand from positions to and through interests, to and through emotions, to and through values, and most importantly, to needs. And I found that while our positions may be very different and interests may be very different, ultimately, Ultimately, our needs are fundamentally the same. Now, we may have different strategies for meeting the needs, but our most fundamental needs are the same. And so if we can shift an interaction from the shouting of the positions or attacking those who hold them to consideration of needs, the conflict is transformed in the most profound ways. And finally, there is exploration. And this is bringing curiosity into conflict and also moving beyond the binary, moving beyond the binary. You know, even if we take, Kevin, some of the most controversial issues we're facing now as a humanity, or we're facing now, let's say, in, the, in North America, you know, uh, uh, gun rights, gun control, right? Big question now, now in, 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 in the U.S., uh, pro-life, pro-choice, blue and red, again, uh, talking about uh, the very polarizing nature of U.S. politics right now, or even white and black. Behind each of these slogans, each of these seemingly binary slogans, there is immense complexity, nuance, and ambiguity. And that is something that we need to explore and lean into for us to really, uh, for us to really um, transform our conflict interactions. Yeah, indeed. And, and, you know, Henry, based on your position and, and the way that you sort of uh, guide your professional life, I'm curious to ask you about uh, the rise in sort of school violence, as you mentioned mm -hmm. earlier, you know, when you turn on the news. And uh, I think that they t told us uh, last night on the news that someone's a victim of... Uh, 49 people are a victim of gun violence every day now in America, and now it's the leading cause of death for uh, children. So I'm curious in your uh, line of work, in your pro professional and personal opinion, how do you think we can create a, a bridge towards unity so people aren't so uh, um, resident to resolve conflicts through uh, gun violence these days. What, what do you think we have to do to sort of uh, rid mm. our consciousness of that decision-making process? Sure. Well, it's a very multifaceted problem, and, and I want to start with that. And there is not one single solution and one single answer, right, that will, that will address all the facets of this problem. So... On, 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 on the most superficial level, um, yes, I do think the uh, extremely liberal uh, gun laws in, in the U.S., uh, which enables someone, you know, someone easily to obtain military-grade weapons, of course, that has to change. Um, that has to change um, because that allows someone to access these weapons and then to do immense amount of damage 
in a very short period of time. But that's only a very small part of the answer because that's not really dealing with the core of the problem. So what is the core of the problem? I think, Kevin, the core of the problem is more and more people, young people, uh, but really all people, I live in a way that is very disconnected, that is very disconnected from whatever is happening within them and is very disconnected from um, other people, from what, is from what is happening in the world. You know, they live in, 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 in their bubbles. And in schools, you know, um, there is so much focus on teaching people math or science or, you know, whatever, whatever the skills are. But there is very little emphasis on teaching people actually how to be, you know, we forget in schools and we forget in our society that we are human beings, not human doings. And the emphasis yet is on doing, 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 you know, doing math, doing science, doing all these different things. But no one actually teaches young people, especially, but even beyond that, how just to be. Sometimes how to be with our discomfort, how to be with our pain, which is an integral part of our experience. And then most importantly, how to be with other people, right? How to be with other people if they trigger us, how to be with other people if we profoundly disagree with them. So I often talk to my students and I ask them, you know, during one of our first classes in school, you know, they come to college and I ask them, how many of you had a class on how to deal with conflict? through all of your schooling, through, you know, elementary school, middle school, or high school, very few people will raise their hand. I will ask them, you know, how many of you have had any classes or any courses that talk about how to deal with stress or how to deal just, you know, with yourself when things are not maybe going the way that, that you prefer? Very few people raise their hands. So these are critical, fundamental skills that we are not teaching people. And I think we're paying a very, very heavy price for that. And I think that's at the core of violence that we're seeing. People simply don't know how to be, how to be with themselves, how to be with other people, how to be with people we profoundly disagree with, how to engage with people. And in many ways, in many ways, Kevin, and that's what leads to the immense wave of violence that we're seeing. Because when someone does not know how to be and someone is disconnected, naturally, they live their life in a way that is othering someone. There is them and there is us or us and them. And whenever there is us and them, inevitably, there's going to be them versus us whoever them may be, whoever them may be. And that's the result, I think, of being very, very disconnected and not seeing the immense interconnectedness of life. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, Henry, uh, I know that you've had the privilege of given, giving uh, two TED Talks, and I know that um, some of those messages in some form, are a part of uh, the TED Talks that you've given. So tell me about uh, the privilege of giving the TED Talks and sort of how they've helped you grow from a personal perspective. Sure. Well, one of the great benefits of giving TEDx Talks, which I gave, is that sometimes, you know, you may have these ideas but when you have to speak, you know, present these ideas in 17 minutes uh, under a deadline, it forces you to really clarify these ideas. It forces you to think about how to communicate these ideas in a way that is relatable, in a way that is engaging, and in a way that will vary very clearly will very clearly deliver the message. So the two um, TEDx talks that I gave, you know, the first one 
was based on my motorcycle journey across the Himalayas. And the title of that talk was What Crossing the Himalayas on a Motorcycle Taught Me About Conflict Connection and Dialogue. And in that talk, I talked about actually the four aspects of conflict transformation, Kevin, that I talked to you about earlier. And this is something that became very, very much crystallized for me during my 2018 motorcycle journey. And then the latest TEDx talk that I gave, which was only a few months ago, uh, was called Radical Compassion as the Goal of Conflict Resolution. And this is where I invited the listeners to begin engaging with other people with the idea that actually we don't know. We don't know. I can never truly be in your shoes because the life experiences that I had, the conditioning, etc., is different. So in many ways, this talk was an invitation for us as a culture, as a society, to move away from the em emphasis and empathy because we can never truly experience what someone else has lived through to the emphasis on compassion. And I define compassion as intimate and infinite connection with another person's humanity combined with the knowledge that we can never truly know or experience what someone has lived through. And if we begin with the idea that we don't know, that I don't know your experience, then the way we engage is through curiosity. Natural curiosity arises, right? And, and, and we start asking, tell me more. Tell me more about your experience. So then I don't assume that I can understand what it is, but I engage with that and I listen, and that's how we learn and grow. Yeah, and Hunter, since you uh, are a native of Ukraine, I'm also curious to ask you, obviously, about the conflict and how you think it's going to end and, and sort of how, how it's impacted the wider or broader international community as well. Mm. So, of course, the conflict in Ukraine is very, very personal to me. And just to... Um, highlight some of the nuances um, of, uh, of these conflicts and how these two people lived. You know, I grew up speaking Russian. My first language is Russian. As it is for probably about 40% of um, people who live in Ukraine, their first language is Russian. Culturally, linguistically, uh, in all other ways, these two countries for, for generations, for centuries, for thousands of years have been very, very close. You know, growing up, I traveled uh, routinely between uh, Russia and Ukraine. And, um, you know, this was not that big of a deal. It was n not that much different than crossing from Ontario to Quebec. Uh, maybe sp people speak a little differently. But you know you're still at the same place. It, it's it's not it, it it's not a place that is particularly different. And of course, this conflict exemplifies right how easily it is to other people, even people who look similar, have very similar cultural identities, have very very similar conditioning. Now, how does this conflict end? Um, I wish I knew. You know. Uh, I, I, I wish I knew. My hope, my hope is that this conflict ends with yet another evaluation and understanding of the dangers of war. Uh, my hope is that this conflict ends uh, not just with the seizure of fighting, uh, or some kind of agreement with regards to territory. But also, but also with truth and reconciliation. Um, but also with deep listening. Um, but also with a discussion involving um, everyone around the world, world leaders, not just Russia, Ukraine, of how this type of tragedy, and it's a tragedy, it's a tragedy, how can we as people ensure that this tragedy, this type of tragedy, does not happen again. Uh, because right now, you know, generations of people who live next to each other, who were neighbors, friends, 
um, often, you know, married each other, now are pointing guns at each other and seeing each other as enemies. And this is, of course, something the trauma of war is going to be impacting generations of people, generations of people. And we've had enough. We've had enough bloodshed. You know, both Russia and Ukraine face some very significant challenges, environmental challenges and other challenges, where they need to work together, where they need to collaborate. So my hope, uh, just like, you know, after World War II, the horrors of World War II and the Holocaust, you had, you know, a certain coming together of Europe, the development of European Union, as controversial and complex as, 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 as even that union has been, but Germany and France, right, once enemies, are now close partners. The identity of being German or French has expanded to the identity of being European. And that's significant. That's significant. So my hope, my hope ultimately, that this conflict results in a broader, more inclusive vision that includes Russians, that includes Ukrainians, in a path forward together as neighbors and as friends. Yes, the thing of puzzle together when we're all connected is much easier than stitching one together when we're divided, right? Yes. Yes, yes. Um because you know, uh, Kevin, something else that 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 I talk about is that and, and people ask me very often, you know, and this is related even to Ukraine and Russia, people ask me what I think of the divisions, you know, we face as people. And I don't think our divisions are a problem. I think lack of vision is. That's that's the real problem. And so my hope is that you know, whether we're talking about North America and all the divisions we see here in North America, whether we take US or whether we take Canada, um, or around the world, that we start moving more and more towards shared, inclusive, unified vision. You know, there are 8 billion people right now on the planet, and we are facing some existential threats and crises that demand that we come together, that demand that we act as one, that demand that we move beyond the very, very limiting uh, national or religious or ethnic or racial identities. Because if we continue to act in that way, just as, you know, I'm going to only act as an American and you're only going to act as a Canadian and someone else is only going to act as Russian or Ukrainian or Indian. This planet is going to be no more. And I think we, we owe a responsibility to future generations to ensure that life on this planet continues. And the only way to do that is for us to develop a unified, inclusive, inspiring, shared vision that can move all the 8 billion people not just one country versus the other, but all the 8 billion people on this planet together as one towards a more prosperous, more inclusive, um, and more sustainable future. Yeah, absolutely. And Henry, my final question uh, for you this morning is a, a two-part question. And the first is, well, put a sort of a bow on our conversation. What is that the key is to cultivating and ultimately sustaining educational equality for all students and how do you think that'll contribute to your personal and professional legacy mm. so ultimately the goal of my work is is to create um a truly inclusive space you know, for, for students. And that's how I hope, you know, my hope is that how I am defined, how I'm remembered, I can control what's happening everywhere else in the world. But if I can be remembered as someone who contributed to creating a more inclusive space, you know, even in this little, you know, corner of the universe where, where I'm living, um, that to me, that would be a meaningful life. Now, 
You know, in terms of educational equality, the student, our students are changing. You know, more and more students are coming from all over the world. More and more students are coming from minoritized backgrounds. More and more students are coming to campuses uh, with different abilities and are pursuing careers and, 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 and fields um, that once were unthinkable for them before. So I think it's important that as we support our students in that, uh, that we also ensure that we have as diverse all the faculty and staff as is possible so that students, whether it's someone is a student who is a disabled or student who comes from an, any other minoritized background, could look up to someone and see, wow, if this person could do this, I could do this too. And connect with people from different backgrounds and learn from people from different backgrounds and engage with people from different backgrounds. And something else that I really hope is that the differences that we come with, the differences that students come to, with to colleges and universities do not become impediments, but on the contrary, create opportunities, create opportunities for growth, opportunities for connection, and opportunities for dialogue. And my hope, my hope, is to continue to create space that these three can happen, that are even difficult interactions, even challenging interactions, become opportunities, opportunities for growth, opportunities for connection, opportunities for dialogue. Yeah, absolutely. And, and finally, Henry, tell me if people want to get connected with you personally and all, the good work that you do, what's the best way they can do that? Sure. So um, I have a website, and the website is www.livingpeaceinstitute.com. Uh, also, I am on LinkedIn. I am on Facebook. I am on Instagram. Um, I'm nominally on Twitter, though I, I, I don't really engage with Twitter or on Twitter. Um, so, of course, people, probably the best way to get in contact with me is to visit my website, and um, there is the email um, ways to connect. There is also uh, links to my TEDx talks and links to uh, my book. And so folks could certainly go there and, and explore that. And again, that's www.livingpeaceinstitute, all one word, dot com. Fabulous, Henry. Well, I, I want to sincerely thank you for engaging in conversation on the important topic of educational and uh, conflict uh, equality and resolution and for providing me with your opinions and expertise on the matter. Your time on my behalf and work in the space is most appreciated and I want to thank you for being here this morning. It's most appreciated. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me and thank you for the amazing work uh, that you're doing and, and great people you're bringing on your podcast and great information you're sharing.